Good morning. Merry Christmas. We're on the last Sunday before Christmas, and I have a message of hope for our kids. Be patient, it's coming. You're going to make it, okay? I know when I was a kid, it seemed like a long way off. It's just a week. You can do it. You can do it. Just eat lots of candy. It's the secret to getting through, right? Love Christmas. Christmas is a great time. It's a great time of hope and expectation. We look forward uh, to what's going to happen, right? We, we, we talk about this uh, each week of our series, Awaiting Advent, right? We're awaiting Christ's second coming while looking back at his first. So it's kind of this hinge uh, uh, time in our season. Uh, but for me personally, Christmas can be a time where it's a little bittersweet. And that's because I really like the season. Like, I really like this time. I like the decorations. I like my Christmas village. I don't want to take it down because it's a lot of work. The decorations now loom over me, and I'm like, God, why did we put up so much? And so also entering into that is a little bit of nostalgia because you have this tendency to look back on Christmases before and inevitably compare them to the Christmas that you're currently in, right? And you might look back at Christmases before, uh, maybe when the kids were little, and you'd be like, man, like, they're never going to be that good again. Like, that was so much fun. We're we're in that season right now. We have two little ones, and and it's a lot. It's a lot. The kids are a lot. It's fun, but they're a lot. You might look back and say, you know, there was a matriarch or a patriarch over the family that kind of made it special. Like they were kind of the anchor of the family and they're gone now. And it can be hard to be like, man, they're never just gonna be the same again. Maybe family just doesn't get together like they used to. People have moved away. And so we have this tendency to look back in this season and, and do some nostalgia. But you can also look back on your life with nostalgia. You can look back over history and say, the, the best things, the best was, was then, this was this season, maybe when you were in business and you were doing well in your career and, and it, it's not that way anymore and you look back and you're like, God, I'm never going to get those years back or, or you look back and, and families moved on or something like that. Nostalgia can be something that can be really good, it can make us grateful, it can also be really bad. It can make us lose hope for the future. We can think that the best years are behind us and the future doesn't have much to offer and we're just kind of coasting to the end. What I want us to do is I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, you can turn there. And I want us to look at how we can look forward to the best days that are ahead of us because as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we believe that our best days are ahead of us because we believe that Jesus is going to return. And when his kingdom comes, it's going to be the best days ever. And so we're going to look today at his rule, his reign, and his realm. So let's start by looking forward to his rule. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. So if you've ever cut down a tree and you've left the stump, sometimes uh, a new tree will grow up out of the stump because the tree's not actually dead. You've just done serious damage to it. And that's the image that's here. That, the, that Isaiah is calling upon. Verse two, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So most of the prophecies in Isaiah up to this point have to do with really three kingdoms. Uh, uh, Israel is one, the northern ten tribes. Judah, the southern two tribes. Remember there's a split kingdom, that's important. And then this mega empire called Assyria. It's actually the Neo-Assyrian empire. And they are bloodthirsty, brutal, violent empire. And they are coming to town. Not like Santa Claus, but with violence. They will conquer Israel, destroy the northern tribes. They will conquer most of Judah and then will leave as they're laid siege to Jerusalem. And so Judah will be, be free for uh, a, few, a couple hundred years, 100 years or so. And then Babylon will come in and exile them. So these are dark days 
for the, kingdom, the people of God. In fact, they can look back. They can look back and say, man, the best days were behind us. We were a unified kingdom at one point. We had great leadership. We were loved. We had the land. The best days are behind us. But into these prophecies of destruction come a message for the remnant, for the people left behind. And it's a message from God saying, hey, the best days aren't behind you. The best days aren't behind you. The best days are to come because there's going to be a great king. And notice how he's described. He comes from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. Now what Isaiah is saying here, what God is saying through Isaiah is that this king to come isn't gonna just be from the line of David. He's not gonna be one of David's descendants alone, meaning inferiority to David. No, because he comes from the stump of Jesse, he is an equal to David. He's just as great, if not greater than David. And he's gonna have this amazing rule. Now, when a king would rule, a rule is the way, the manner in which a king would govern his people. So a rule of a king could be just or unjust, tyrannical, benevolent, stable, unstable. And in verses two through five, Isaiah tells us about this king's rule. Look at how it's described. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This means that the spirit of God is gonna guide and and move in this king's life. Now, other leaders had the spirit of God. Moses, David, Solomon, but those were temporary fixtures. The spirit of God would come and go, empowering them for certain tasks, This king is going to have the spirit of God perpetually. And that fact is going to change the way in which he rules. It says he's going to have a spirit of wisdom and understanding. He's going to be able to look at the heart of a matter and make right decisions. It also says that he's going to have the spirit of counsel and might. This means that he's going to know what's the good thing to do, and then he's going to have the power to enact that good thing. Very often we know what the right thing to do is, but we may not have the ability to do it. That will not be the case with this king. And then lastly, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. It even says it twice. It says his delight will be in the fear of the Lord. This king to come is going to be so close with the Lord that his delight is going to be in spending time with the Lord and doing what the Lord desires. He's going to be close to him. He's going to be close to him. And in verses three through five, it gives metaphorical language as to what this is actually gonna look like. He's gonna decide between the rich and the poor. And it doesn't mean he's always gonna decide for the poor. Because poor people can do unjust things too, just like rich people can. He's gonna see, he's not gonna be fooled by nice clothes and, and, and wealth or poverty. He's gonna make right decisions. It says too that he's gonna strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. This is an allusion back to Genesis. When God creates, he speaks, let there be light, and it happens, right? A king speaks and his servants go and do. The king doesn't have to lift a finger. A good king doesn't. He can sit on his throne and rule. And this is what's going to take place. And then it says righteousness and faithfulness are going to be his belt. Back in those days, everybody wore long robes. And so if you wanted to do anything active, you had to to hike those up, give your legs freedom of movement. And so oftentimes they would have a belt that they could tuck those robes into so they could move about. Righteousness, faithfulness, those are going to be his platforms of action. These are what's going to gird his realm, his reign, his rule. Now we know, because we're followers of Jesus Christ, you're in a church, it's Christmas time, you know this is Jesus Christ. The person foretold here is the baby born in a manger. This is Jesus. And so there's a great deal of optimism in reading this, because leadership has a lot to do with whether or not you look forward to the future. If your boss or, or, is, or your teacher is a good teacher or a good boss, you have stability, you have a lot of optimism for the next year. But if you get a teacher you don't like, or you have a boss that you can't stand, or the boss you like got removed or has moved on and you've got a new one, there's instability there, there's fear, there's worry within that. Leadership has a lot to do with that. And many of us don't know if we can trust Jesus with our future. Many of us don't know if we can trust his leadership. We're nervous when we get around somebody who claims absolute power, absolute authority. Because for some of us, we've been hurt before. Not by Jesus, 
but by his church, perhaps, the people of God. Maybe somebody in power, maybe a parent or a teacher or a coach at some point did something very wrong, abusive even. You trusted them and they betrayed you. Maybe you're fooled. Maybe you thought you were working for good and it turns out you were just building somebody's platform. You were being used. But there's an opportunity today for you to put your trust in another leader, another authority figure, somebody who's powerful, somebody who's good and just, but you still might find yourself being reluctant. Because for some of us, we think our best days are behind us because the, the years before were so good. But others of us think our best days are behind us because we don't have any hope for the future. You don't think better days are coming because the years before were so bad. You don't have any hope. Somebody somewhere took it from you. It's been beaten out of you. Life circumstances has robbed you of it. This is what happened to Israel and Judah. They had some good kings. They had David. They had Solomon. They're going to have Hezekiah. They also had some really bad kings. Ahab, Saul, Ahaz, Manasseh. Kind of makes you wonder whether or not you can trust those in leadership. All of us are carrying pain in our life today. And Christmas has this really brutal way of highlighting it for some reason. I wish I could take that pain away from you and wear it for a season, but I can't. There's only one human being who can. And he was the baby born in a manger. His name is Jesus. This is what the incarnation is all about, to bring righteous rule over people who need it, who need a leader that they can trust, somebody they can count on, somebody they can take their fears and their problems to. This is what Mary sings about in the Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. She sings about those in power being brought low, those who are in trouble being raised up, and all from this stump of Jesse coming to rule and reign. This is why we celebrate Jesus' return. This is why we look forward. This is why our best days are ahead. It's because we're going to have a king, a good king. So let me ask you this. How do you unshackle yourself from a past that imprisons you, that entangles you, that ensnares you. In a word, you don't, because you can't. It's much too large of a monster for you to slay. You have to do what people did for hundreds of years. When there was a monarchy, when there was an injustice done, they would bring it before the king. They would say, my neighbor did this. I was robbed, these people stole from me. A band of thieves came in and took things. And king, you need to do something about it. That was the king's primary job. It wasn't to conquer. It wasn't to build an empire. It was to ensure stability and justice within his borders. You need to take the same injustices that you experience, the same fears, the same worries, the same wounds, and bring them before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I'm hurting. Help. Do something about this. Pray for justice. Pray for healing. Pray for there to be rest and restoration. Jesus didn't die on the cross he didn't take wounds and beatings so that we could walk through life with wounds and beatings of our own. He wants to take those on from us. Turn to him. Turn to his cross. Turn to the resurrection. Give him your life. Because the resurrection, you know what the resurrection is? It's a sign. It's a sign that the bad guys don't win. Because when Jesus dies, he's the most righteous man to ever live. He's perfect. Never does anything wrong. And when he dies, God says, no, that's not just. He doesn't deserve to die. So he overturns that death. It's like a judicial appeal. He overturns the death. And so the bad guys, Pilate, Caiaphas, all those guys, they don't get to win. And it sets a new precedent. In the old days, the days before, the days we look back on and say, oh, those were better years, the bad guys won. But not anymore. Because in the rule and reign of Christ, when we put our trust and our faith in him, his righteousness is imputed to us. That means when God looks at us, the injustices that are done to us, the evil that is done to us, even our own death is overturned on appeal because of Christ's righteousness, not our own. The resurrection is a message that the bad guys don't win. The baby in a manger is a promise. 
This little baby, so capable of being abused, so capable of being destroyed. That's what Herod tries to do. Herod the Great raids Bethlehem tries to, and actually kills every male child. This great injustice is done. And this baby in the manger survives. Why? To remind you that the bad guys don't win. That the injustice does not keep going. So what do you do? You turn to the Lord. You give him your trust. And you go to him again and again and again and again. Jesus tells this great story of this woman who wants justice from an unjust judge. And she beats on his door like every night. And he tells her, go away, go away, go away. And finally he gives in. Why? Because he's sick of her. She's tired of it. And the point of the story is if you're going to pray, be persistent Because you're not praying to an unjust judge that's tired of hearing from you. You're praying to a father that loves you and he's quick to do things for you. So be in prayer about the injustices that you see, that you experience. Look forward to his rule. It's gonna be glorious. But we also look forward to his reign. To his reign. Reign of a monarch typically is a time period, right? So from X date to X date, such king or queen ruled over the, 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 the kingdom. And we have gone about in our day and age looking at history through lenses of defining eras by certain monarchs. Some monarchs were so influential, so powerful, they changed culture so much that we just define the era by them. The Elizabethan era, right? That's Elizabeth I, Shakespeare, exploration was going on. That's the Elizabethan era. The Victorian era, Queen Victoria, The empire that the sun never set on, she's in charge of it. And so we look back on that era. And in these reigns, kings are supposed to provide great deals of stability. That's what what makes these reigns known for so much. Stability, prosperity, justice, peace. That's what's kind of the hallmark of those reigns. And in Isaiah's prophecy, the reign of Christ is going to have to do that but top it. And look how it happens in verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is an amazing passage. It's almost fantastic. I feel like we've opened the back door of the cupboard of the wardrobe and we're in Narnia now because there's all these animals doing strange things that they don't normally do. But I take this passage as as literal. I think this is legitimately what the rule and reign of Christ will look like in the new heaven and the new earth when Christ returns. There's going to be changes that happen. Such changes that violence and death no longer have a place in the kingdom. I don't know what this does for my philosophy also that there will be good stake in heaven, but I haven't reconciled those two things yet, so we'll figure it out. I'll be happy either way. But look at what's described. There's no rivalries. The animals that typically you pit against each other, one's prey, one's predator, those are gone. They're stabled together. You can put the fox in charge of the hen house now. There's no exploitation anymore. There's nobody taken advantage of. And in this situation, humanity is restored as the image bearer of God. Now, we didn't lose the image, but it's been marred. It's been scarred by sin, by brokenness. And so we started out pretty good. Adam and Eve ruling and reigning over creation, doing what they were supposed to do, but then they ate the fruit. And now all of a sudden, our rule and reign has changed. We've become tyrants over the rest of creation. Our reign is naturally exploitive. We can't help it. Even when we try to be as environmentally conscious as we can, we can't help it. We get oil from the earth, and by accident, a tanker will spill in the ocean, ruining environments. Nobody wants that to happen, but it does. We even do some things intentionally to harm the environment because we have this lust for control and for power. Species are extinct. But look, it's difficult to manage creation. It's difficult for everybody. Our population has 7 billion plus people. It's difficult to make sure everybody has what they need while at the same time making sure this globe keeps spinning in a perfect homeostasis. Ruling and reigning over this place is difficult. But look how the text describes what's happening. 
It says in verse 6, and a little child shall lead them. So apparently ruling and reigning over the new heaven and the new earth under a risen Messiah is going to be so easy a child can do it. And look at the animals present. Forget about the wolf for a second. But you've got a leopard and a lion. Have you ever heard the expression, it's like herding cats? It's difficult, right? Things are hard. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. It's like herding cats, right? It's difficult. Well, apparently there's going to be a new expression. It's like, man, this is going to be so easy. It's going to be like herding cats. Because a little child can lead the cats. By the way, mark it down. I came up with a new phrase, a new use for the phrase. And I insist we copyright it in the new kingdom. You heard it here first. Lastly, the naturally vulnerable children are not going to be exploited anymore by those who are naturally deceptive. Snakes. This image goes back to Genesis 3. Curses are being handed down. And God says there's going to be an offspring, a seed of the woman, who's going to come in conflict with the seed of the serpent. And he's going to crush him. And this is what Christ does on the cross. He crushes the head of the serpent. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so there's no need for animosity anymore. There's no need for animosity between the serpent and between people. There's healing and restoration for those who have been exploited. But this is important to hear as well. There's healing and restoration for those who have done the exploiting. For those who have been abused and for the abuser. We have a tendency in our culture, and it's right. This is rightfully so. Don't hear the wrong thing here. We're in a culture now where we're blowing the whistle on abusers. We're calling that out, and that's a good thing. Abuse should not happen. If you're in a situation where you're being abused, you need to call it out. Come get help. Let us help you. But if you're somebody who's doing the abusing, there's redemption for you as well. This is what the cross of Christ is. We've all said an unkind word. We've all done unkind things. And for some of us, it goes much further than that. And there are consequences. There are legal consequences, perhaps. But come to Christ, and there's forgiveness, and you have an invitation to the kingdom as well. That's where healing can begin. If you turn to him, you open your fist. See, there's this little verse at the end, verse nine, that tells us why all this is possible. Verse nine, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The reason why our world is in the shape that it's in now is because we lack knowledge of God. And it's not knowing him in a intellectual sense. We don't know him and so we don't trust him. You trust people you know. We don't trust him because we don't really know him. We don't know him intimately. And this is what went wrong in the garden. Adam and Eve stopped trusting what God told them about the fruit. And instead they went with their eyes. They went with their their taste buds. It even says Eve saw that the fruit was good. She's like, that looks tasty. I'm going to take a bite. We do this too. We do this too. This is what went wrong. Because when you stop trusting the Lord, here's what has to happen. You have to get by on your own cunning, your own wits, your own abilities. You see, the wolf and the lion and the leopard and the snake weren't the only ones who grew claws, teeth, and venom in the fall. We did too. We say venomous words and strike people down. We crush people between the jaws of our selfishness and our desires. We shred people with claws of ambition and control. We fail to know the Lord. We fail to trust him. And I'll tell you what, if that's where you're at, if you fail to know the Lord, you better get some claws because it's all on you. You've got to take care of yourself. We've traded the life in the garden for the law of the jungle where it's kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. And this is why many of us think our best years are behind us because you used to swim with the sharks. You used to run with the cheetah. And now those days are long gone. Maybe you've aged, younger, stronger. Sharks have come swimming into your waters and pushed you out. Maybe you got sick at some point and you just couldn't keep up anymore. Whatever the case may be, you were living by the law of the jungle. And you were surprised when the jungle ate back. And so here we are today. Jesus says that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. You can lay the sword down today. You can drop it. You can come to Christ. You can let him protect you. 
You can stop trying to fight for survival. Jesus suffered and died so that you would not have to be a victim or a victimizer, so that you would not have to be prey or a predator. You can either be king of the jungle or you can abdicate for the real king. You gotta make the Lord your trust. You've gotta put him as your hope. And maybe you need to do it for the first time. Maybe this is the first time you're gonna do it. Christmas is a great time. It's a great time. And then you gotta choose him every day, again and again. You choose to trust him when you don't lash out with a hurtful response to somebody because you trust the Lord to speak up for you and to defend you. It allows you to be generous because you trust the Lord to take care of you. We've talked about for weeks now that we need our church body to step up and to give. If you're a part of this church, if you attend here regularly, if somebody asks you, where do you go to church? And you respond, Park City's Baptist Church. It's on you. It's your opportunity to give. And to give in faith, knowing that the Lord is going to take care of you. You can make yourself vulnerable because the Lord will protect you. You can share things about yourself you'd never share before. Because you don't have to worry about somebody eating you because the Lord's going to take care of you. And the great thing is, the best days aren't behind you when you're pursuing the knowledge of the Lord because the Lord is infinite. I believe in the eternal kingdom. Yeah, we're gonna know the Lord better than we ever have, but I think we're gonna keep getting to know him. We're not gonna wake up in the eternal kingdom and be like, oh, I know everything now. What's the fun in that? God is infinite. Every day we're getting to know more and more and more about him. And that's why every day is better than the last one because you know more about God today than you knew before. And so your best days will continue to be ahead of you because of that. So look forward to the return of Christ. We can know him more. This kingdom that will have no end where the law of the jungle doesn't rule our hearts, but it's the law of Christ and the law of love. And so we can look forward to his rule. We look forward to his reign and we can look forward to his realm. A realm is quite simply the area over which a king rules and the people that fall into that area. And he talks about these people in verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. Basically, that's a fun way of saying north, south, east, West. He'll raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim, that's another name for Israel, shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt and will wave his hand over the river, that's the Red Sea and the Euphrates, with his scorching breath and strike it into seven channels, and he will lead people across in sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant that remains of his people as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt." We know that Israel will get scattered. God's people are going to get thrown all over the world. Ten tribes, we don't know what happened to them. Judah gets exiled by Babylon. And this is a prophecy that God's going to bring God's people back under his rule and his reign. And how he's going to do it is he's going to remove every obstacle that they face. And he's going to put in place a a, a, a wealth and splendor for them to live comfortably. And so this is why he describes the Red Sea. The Red Sea is the first barrier that the Israelites had to cross when they came out of Egypt. And it kind of stands as this metaphor for future obstacles. The internal conflict between Judah and Israel, between God's people is gonna go away. They're gonna be unified again. And this plunder of their enemies, it just means they're gonna be comfortable. They're gonna be taken care of. You see, in Israel's day, how do you not look back on the crossing of the Red Sea, David and Goliath and the unified kingdom and think to yourself, man, the best days were behind us. Those are great days. We even look back and we're like, God's not going to part waters again. He's not going to do that again. You see, when your days behind you were so good, it's hard to look forward to the future because you think God's not going to top it. Your past can be a barrier to you worshiping out of your present. It can be. But you're invited. You've been invited just like these people. You're invited to the realm of the king. You can come to the holy mountain of God as it describes in verse nine. Jesus was crucified and buried on a hill outside of a city so that you could be invited to a mountain of God. 
and you can worship him there. You're invited to the realm. You're invited to worship a king whose greatest act was seen as a failure at the time. You're invited to a king who came with nothing in his first advent, but his second advent, he will come with great splendor that he's gonna share with all of us. So what do we do with this? What do we do? I would say, what's in your past? What are you nostalgic about? What do you miss? Christmas is a nostalgic time. Do you miss family? Do you miss friends? What do you miss? What's behind? Let those be springboards to worship. Did you thank God for the great things you had when you had them? If you didn't, there's nothing wrong with looking back and saying, God, I am grateful for the work that I was able to do. I'm grateful for my career. I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for the friends that I've had. Another thing to think about is if God has removed boundaries and barriers for people coming to worship, does he not want, does he not want his people to move those barriers as well? Is there a red sea of bitterness between you and another person? Move it. Drain it. Seek forgiveness. Is there jealousy breaking up unity between you and another person? Confess your jealousy to somebody. Seek their forgiveness. What old friends could you reach out to? What new friends could you make? We have a job to do. It's to expand the realm of the kingdom. And when we make steps like that, when we put ourselves out there, we expand the kingdom into the hearts and lives of other people. We look forward to the rule of Christ. It will be beautiful and glorious because it will be just and righteous. We look forward to his reign because it's going to change the culture. It's already changing us. If you put your faith in Christ, it's changing you. And we look forward to his realm. A beautiful, beautiful place where there's no obstacles to coming to him. And so we look forward to the return of Christ because our best days aren't behind us. They are yet to come because our king has come and he's coming again. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, how good it is to worship you. How grateful we are that you are a king who cared enough not just to visit us once, but you're gonna visit us again. In the meantime, Lord, I pray that justice would be done, that you'd bring healing to broken hearts. I pray that we would look forward to the days ahead with hope, not because of anything happening in our lives, but because of our great king. In your son's name we pray, amen.